This is episode 214 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today it is part two of our weight loss series, and we talk about set point and our potential ability to control our body weight with an expert in set point, Chris Sandal. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going to Beyond the Food Show. I'm Stephanie Dozier, clinical nutritionist and emotional eating expert, creator of the Going to Beyond the Food method and founder of the Going to Beyond the Food Academy. Corporate executive turned health expert with my own journey with weight, body image, and food. It's now my mission to help smart, successful women like you live confidently right now and unconditionally. Ready, sister? Let's do this. Hello, sisters. Welcome back. And this is part two of the weight loss series. And I just want to remind all of us what is the intention behind this series around weight loss. It is not a weight loss tool. Okay. I've had a few questions about this and and it is not the intention of this series. And I get why when we first come to the world of going beyond the food or the world of intuitive eating or body neutrality, we literally scan our entire environment for a potential solution to this thing that is our weight that we're now conflicted about, right? When we come to our world of an anti-diet world, we are being told that You know, there's no way for you to control your weight. And and not only there's no way to do it, it's not safe, right? 95% of the diet don't work and there's side effect. And we're in shock, right? We are in that period that I call grieving the thin ideal. And that's who this weight loss series is for. It's for the people that are in that period of time where they're in between the two worlds of the dieting world and the non-dieting world, <laughs> I'm like balancing my body back and forth. I speak with my hands a lot, but that's the intention of this series. It's for you who are there right now. And part of the process of grieving this potential possibility of being thin without the side effect that you now are aware of is understanding the science. It's satisfying that left part of your brain. Like if you've never heard me talk about this, it's an analogy to express what goes on in your brain, right? We kind of have a dichotomy in our brain, the left and the right brain, left being very analytical and the right side of the brain being the emotion aspect of us. And part of the grieving process is satisfying both sides of your brain and understanding the science behind weight loss is critical in the grieving process. We opened the part one of this weight loss series with Aaron Flores, where we covered the whole, but I need to lose weight, right? That, that first entry part into this period of our life where we're hanging on to, but I need to lose weight, right? There's a medical reason. There's like, there has to be a valid reason why weight loss is okay for me. And I need to find a solution, right? So that was part one. So I would go back to this episode 212 and start from that place. Today is all about set point. Set point is this mechanism that we have in our body that manage our body weight. I want you to think of set point like the fat thermometer, as Linda Bacon in her book, Health at Every Size, like to explain to us. It's that literally thermometer into your body that will say, okay, we'll scan the environment, we'll say, okay, we need to gain weight or we need to lose weight, right? It's like the thermometer in your room for managing the heat, We have that mechanism in our body that it's managed by a part of our brain called the hypothalamus that literally runs the show when it comes to your weight. We externally think we're smarter with the diet and we're saying to the body, screw you, I'm going to take control and I'm going to tell you what to do. That's what we hope to do with dieting. We hope to control externally 
our body weight. So the question is, can it work? Can it ever work? Like, how is the set point biology, physiology in the human body function? And then can dieting control those function? And that's the question that our guest expert today is going to attempt to answer. His name is Chris Sandel. He's a UK-based nutritionist and the host of Real Health Radio. Chris' approach to food and health is anti-diet, non-dogmatic, but he's an expert in the world of set point and all the research around it from both angle. And that's why I brought him on for us you, me, and him to go over what we know about set point. So we're going to explain what is the set point theory, and you'll understand why we call that a theory in the podcast, how our body determines our set point, the influences are genetic, how does the body keep us at a certain standpoint, the model of calorie in, calorie out, how does it work, is it true, and At the end of the podcast, and I want you to stay through, it's a long episode, it's a long interview because that's a big topic. At the end, I'm going to come back with a next step and how you can reframe how you think about your weight and your set point. So I'll see you at the end of the interview with that quick coaching moment. So welcome to the show, Chris. Stephanie, thank you for having me. It's an honor to have you here. And we've been talking for 10 minutes. I'm like, okay, we've got to stop talking and start <laughs> recording now. <laughs> yeah. Because we're having some very good discussion. So we're going to go right into this topic of set point. This is something I've been wanting to talk a lot about. However, I focus my research on other parts of the relationship to food. So I thought Chris would be the perfect guest to teach us what is set point, how the body managed the weight, and the conversation will go from there. So let's start with very open question. What is set point? So set point is it's a theory. It's this idea that the body naturally and automatically controls your weight. And the theory suggests that the body weight is regulated at sort of a predetermined or a preferred level. And it does this by sort of different feedback control mechanisms. And look, this is, I do want to say from the outset is this is very much a theory and there are different theories that I'm going to put all under the umbrella of weight set point theory. And we can kind of get into to some of that at some point. But it's, yeah, trying to explain how the body regulates its its own weight. And as part of this, it's estimated that roughly between sort of 10 and 15% is where the body likes to, to keep you. So your weight set point isn't a specific number. It's, it's kind of a range. And so you can go up a little, you can go down a little, and the body's pretty okay with that. But it's when you're starting to really sort of push out of those ranges that it becomes more difficult and the body then starts to change certain hormones, change different sort of regulating functions to then bring you back down or to push you back up to that range that it likes to keep you at. And this is kind of why dieting is such a failed endeavor for so many people, especially if you if you go out longer than sort of a year, two years, go to like the five year mark because the body really wants to keep you at a at a range that it determines that it thinks is preferential for your body. So that's kind of a, a very brief overview of, of set point theory. And I like the fact that you highlight it's a theory because the research at this point is not conclusive to exactly how the body manage weight. Yeah. And you'll take us through different theory that there is out there a different perspective on it, but it's not a black and white answer that we can get at this point. So for all of you with diet brain who wants a black and white answer, this is not black and white. You got to take in many things here. So you want to take us through that? Yeah. So, I mean, as part of doing this research on this, I, I went through lots of different papers around the idea of set point theory and how the body can potentially be regulating our weight. And look, I I will also say from the outset that I think bias has a way of getting into science. Like the people who do science are human beings and we all have our biases. And so 
undoubtedly there are going to be some things that are being impacted upon this and this is how or why science is skewing a certain way in in some theories or why people hold certain beliefs but yeah when you look at how does the body sort of regulate or at least how does the body know what it weighs there's quite a number of different proxies by which it can do this so the first one and this really does directly relate to set point theory. So set point theory kind of holds that or the fat percentage that, that the body has is what is regulating where your set point should be. And so what they discovered, and it was fairly recently they discovered to leptin. So this is, is a hormone that regulates appetite and our desire to eat. And what they found is as your fat levels go up, your leptin levels will increase. And as leptin levels increase, your hunger decreases. And the reverse is is true. So as fat levels go down, your leptin levels go down, and then your hunger increases. And that is a sort of gross oversimplification of it. And when I say sort of fat goes up and down, that's, again, for where your body wants to be sitting at. And so the theory is that by using leptin, the body is able to regulate where it keeps you. The next one is looking at body mass in general. So just what do you weigh, irrespective of whether that is bone, whether that is lean tissue, whether that's fat mass, it doesn't really matter. And what they did, there was a couple of really interesting experiments that they did with this. It's done in rats, so it's not done in humans, but it can give us a little bit of an idea. And so what they did in in one of the experiments was they put these rats in a hypergravity environment. And so hyper meaning high, so an environment that is basically the opposite of space. So it is pulling the, the rats down. And when you're doing that, you're in essence creating a situation where the rat's body now feels like it is a higher mass because of that extra gravity. And what they found when they put them in that environment is initially the rat started to eat less. They then lost weight. And then at some point, once their weight came down, they started to eat like they were eating before. And it didn't match up perfectly that their new mass was now the same, but it did lead to a decrease. The other experiment they did was doing surgeries on rats. And what they would do is they would insert an inert substance into them, like an inert rod. So it's the equivalent of putting like a backpack full of rocks on a rat. So the same kind of idea of being in hypergravity or increasing that mass. And again, what they found was that the rats then initially started to eat less and then they started to eat the same as they were doing before and they and they lost they lost weight. I know with this there were differences between the sort of the male and female rats and this could point towards different hormones and, and how that's impacted. But yeah, mass in total appears to be an impact or a proxy. What's interesting in all those study is that it's all subconscious behavior in mean that they didn't put them on the diet, they didn't overfeed them, the body regulated itself subconsciously or the rat body subconsciously regulated itself. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, they, these rats, it wasn't that they were messing with their food. So a lot of rat experiments are like, oh, we give them hyperpalatable food or whatever. It was nothing else changed apart from we've inserted this rod into you or we've put you in this hypergravity environment. And that was what changed, which I think for me is quite a good indicator that there is something going on from a regulatory perspective of the body trying to manipulate its own weight. Another potential proxy is lean tissue. So not the amount of fat that the body has, but the amount of lean tissue that the body has. And the best one I can give as an example for this and and how this could be potentially true is the Minnesota starvation experiment. So have you talked about this as part of your podcast? Not not yet. So the Minnesota starvation experiment is a really fascinating, interesting experiment. I've actually done a couple of podcasts on this as, as part of my show. It's interesting because in theory, you wouldn't be able to repeat it for ethical reasons, although I did make that statement. And then more recently, there's an experiment that they're trying to do with, I think, teenage, it could be teenage boys and teenage girls in Australia, which is pretty similar to what was recommended as part of this experiment, which is horrifying. 
So the experiment was done back in the end of World War II. So I think it was 44, 45. And the reason for doing the experiment was it looked like there was going to be these real food shortages after the end of the war. And they just didn't know what was going to happen when you have a great chunk of Europe all starving. And so they wanted to see, okay, what happens to the body when you put them into this state? And also what could potentially be the best diet to be feeding someone who is in that state to create the least damage? And so they took, I think it was... 30, I'm blanking on the exact figure, somewhere around like 25 to 30 men. They were conscientious objectors. They were all fit. They were all healthy. They were all lean. They had all gone through this barrage of tests. I think there was initially something like 400 people that they whittled down to the final 25 or 30. So they wanted to pick people who were the most kind of robust to then see how it would pan out. And so it started with and a period where they were just fed their normal calories to keep them at, at baseline weight. And that was around about 3,200 calories a day. And so that was what the men were, were using and needing to stay at their weight. And then over the next 26 weeks, they slashed their calories. And it was roughly cutting it in half, although it did fluctuate a little bit. So what they were wanting to do was to get them to lose and again, I'm blanking on the exact figure. It was either 20 or 25% of their original weight. And they wanted to then see what would happen as, as part of, of that. And so if someone was losing weight more quickly, their calories would be a little higher. If someone was losing weight more slowly, it would be a little lower. But it was roughly about 1,600 calories a day. And I just want to flag that that was considered a starvation or STEMI starvation diet. And most people would think 1,600 calories a day, that seems like a lot of food because when I read in this magazine, it was telling me I should be eating 1,000 or 1,200 or, or whatever it may be. I know. I'm laughing as he's saying that because that's what diet culture wants you to believe, right? 1,600 calorie is a normal way of eating. And yep. that's when you get perspective like this on study, that's when you realize how diet culture is invasive in what and how we should eat. Anyway, carry on. Yeah. And so yeah, over those 26 weeks, these men just really deteriorated in, in basically every way imaginable. So they had mental health issues that were coming up. They had lethargy. They were always cold. They were having preoccupation with food. They were getting cookbooks. They were wanting to open restaurants. They would become really agitated. They were losing their hair. Their skin got terrible. Their sperm count dropped right down. I mean, just everything that could go wrong really did go wrong. And then at the end of that 26 weeks, they had a period where they were then trying to feed them different diets and breakdowns of still a reduced amount of calories to see what was best to be potentially feeding to Europe after the war. And what they found as part of that was it really didn't matter if you're undernourished that much, if you've got a little more carbs or a little more protein or a little, it would just all washed out because it just wasn't enough, like calories trumped everything else. So after that period, they were then able to eat as much as they want. And the records are that within the first couple of days, in the first couple of weeks, they're averaging 10,000 calories a day. They actually had to put a stop, well, they decided to put a stop to it so that on, I think it was either on the weekends or during the week, they would still put a level to some ceiling to it, which I think was like 4,000 or 5,000. But then on the weekends or then during the week, they're allowed to eat as much as possible. But these guys just basically did what would be considered like a binge mm -hmm. or would be considered like binge eating disorder or however you want to frame it. But it was just, this is your response to restriction. And so then as they started to eat, they started to, to put on weight and their body started to restore and their body preferentially put on fat tissue more than anything else. And the reason I'm bringing all of this up to then connect to the lean tissue component is it was when you look at their recovery, and it is not as clear cut as this, but what they started to notice was at the point at which they finally stopped putting on weight, their fat levels were much, much higher than where they were at pre-experiment levels, mm. but their lean tissue 
was basically restored back to where they had started. So it was pretty much once the lean tissue got back to where it was before they went on this extreme starvation, that was when the body was like, okay, cool. Eight, even though they were still eating high amounts of calories. And so roughly, originally it was indicated that roughly after a year, they were sort of all back to where they they originally started. From further research I've done, it was probably by three to five years. But I do also want to just say that these guys had never had weight problems to start. This was the only time they ever did anything like this. All of them absolutely detested it. And like they weren't bringing the, this upon themselves. They were doing it because they were part of, of an experiment. And when it was over, all of them were like, my God, I cannot wait to have this be over. And I don't want to ever do this again. It's very interesting because most health study, in particular weight study, are done on healthy young people, particularly men. And that was the Minnesota study, right? Yep. So to my listener that are 99% women, like there is differences between male and female body. And plus what you highlighted, they only did that once. Yep. What happens when we do that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in our life? Exactly. That's the question that we don't even know. There's no, well, I think the closest research is around the biggest loser perhaps, right? Yeah, it is. But I, I think the thing I would say with this, it would be interesting to look at what happens when someone restores their lean tissue because I don't often see research on that because it, what tends to happen is, as I said, the body preferentially when it is restoring puts on fat quicker than it puts on lean tissue. And so you go on a diet, you lose some weight, you then start eating again. Even if you go back to the original weight you were at, your lean tissue may be a little lower and your fat percentage may be a little higher. It's then at that point, you're like, oh my gosh, alarm bells, I need to go on another diet. You then do another diet. And so you do that 10, 15, 20 times. I would be interested to see where is someone's lean tissue at the end of those 20 times versus before they started dieting. What about the genetic component? So I want to touch upon that because that's a huge one as well before we move on to the next question. But there is research around that as well. So the genetic component is is interesting. I'd say this is also pretty messy because yeah. it's hard to hard to pick apart. And I'd say sometimes what gets put under the bracket of genetics could also be what happened when someone was in utero. So is it genetics or is it what was going on with, with the mother during during pregnancy? But what they've looked at here is identical twin studies where twins are separated at birth. So they look at, okay, what happens when these two twins who are genetically very, very similar are then separated at birth and then we catch up with them when they're 20 or 30, what is going on with, with their weight with the idea that with some of those twins, they're going to be living very different lives in very different environments with different levels of affluence or poverty, different levels of or different types of food environments, et cetera. And what they found out of that research is somewhere between like 50 to 70% of someone's weight is from genetics. And so I don't know exactly how they come up with those with those figures, but that's the estimation that it is very much driven by your genetics. I mean, even if I think about myself, I've got a brother and I've got a sister, and all of us have very different body types, and we have very different propensities to put on weight or to to where we stay, and we all grew up in the same household. We all ate the similar kinds of food. I mean, yes, some would have eaten more than others or whatever, but where did that desire come from, et cetera? So I think just from looking at that part of it, it's very interesting. And for me, I'm like, okay, genetics clearly plays a role because three kids who grew up in the same household have different body shapes. And that also opens the door to the concept of epigenetic, the influence yeah. of the environment on our gene. And that, I think the, the experiment with identical twins separated proves that component that how you live your life mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically influence how your genes activate or don't activate or express itself. Totally. And so, yeah, it's then hard to kind of yeah pull those, those things out. And like genetics, 
apart from like there are definitely certain things that genetically mean okay this is definitely going to happen but they are very much at the extreme end of things and most of the time genetics yeah as you say like are influenced by the environment and even like when we talk about i think it gets very simplified when it's talked about within the media of like okay there's this obesity gene or there's this gene that does this or whatever that that is just not true there are going to be like thousands of genes that are related to to any one thing and even those genes don't cause it it just increases your likelihood of of those things occurring Awesome. So I think we can have a pretty clear picture that set point, we don't have a defined answer of what it is and, and how the body actually managed the weight, I guess our yep. body weight. But the mechanism that we know as far as how the body does affect the set point, we do have some viewpoint on that. And I referred to earlier as the biggest loser study. Yep. That was done a few years ago where where they look back. Yeah. What did we learn from that on how the body maintains the set point? So when they looked back on that, what they saw was that people who are then living at that lower weight compared to where their body was before. And that lower weight is happening because of decreased food intake, the increased exercise, et cetera. A lot of it is coming from lower metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate. So for example, you have someone who is at a a certain weight and they need 2,000 calories a day. And I'm just pulling numbers out of the air just to to give an example. So you've got someone at at a weight and they need 2,000 calories a day. You have someone who was heavier, who was now dieted down and exercised down to that level. They may be at the same weight as that other person, but actually to maintain that, they need 1,800 calories a day. Mm -hmm. And so you're now in a situation where your body is needing and when I say needing less, it's not needing less, but it's it can only use less to then maintain that weight. And the reason for that is your body to is trying to fight back to get you to to increase. And the way that it does that is it turns down certain functions, it turns off certain functions, because it's like we don't really want to be sitting at this point. We want to be sitting higher than this point. And so what they found was that Yeah, these people after all of this length of time, and I think it was following them uh, about six years, six years afterwards, and they found that even after that time, their their metabolic rate hadn't sort of recovered. So it was still at a much lower figure than someone who had naturally been at that weight. I mean, the the thing I would want to add to this is I saw a lot of people kind of speculating and and trying to pull this apart. and, And one of the things that someone said, and I don't know what the validity is to this, and so I'm just trying to mention it so that I'm not kind of just being biased in in one direction, was that they said, well, maybe these people are now being followed as part of a review. So maybe it's at this point that they've started to crank up the dieting again and crank up the exercise again, and so that's what's pulled down their, their metabolic rate. And actually, if the interviewers hadn't been here, et cetera, then it would have been steady So I don't know, but my sense is from doing this work for the last decade and working with clients and sort of seeing how their body has impacted is that, yeah, your body is defending a weight. And when you drop below metabolically, your body slows everything down. The body goes through a mechanism or a pathway to protect you from the threat that you impose to your body. It's all about safety. Yep, definitely. And I just want to mention something else because I digged into that study for a course that I'm giving to my student on health. And what's fascinating is there was 15 people that they studied six years later, 14 out of the 15 had regained the weight. There was one person that maintained the weight within a 10 pound range and she had to work at maintaining her weight an hour and a half a day yeah between exercising and controlling food and measuring food and weighing food totally and so imagine if that was going on with someone who is in a very very thin body that we would diagnose as anorexic 
we would look at that behavior and say, this is disordered. What you are doing is causing a problem. This is not how you think about food. This is not how you think about exercise. This isn't supporting you. And yet you take that to the someone who's in a in a larger body and they are then congratulated and told, wow, you've you've kind of got really good willpower. You're doing the things that you should be doing. And so I, I think sometimes it's useful to kind of do those kind of thought experiments or, or put it into a, a different context, because typically the people who are able to keep weight off long term and look, there are going to be like unicorns. There are people who don't end up in that place. But yeah, the vast majority who do are keeping up behaviors that in another circumstance would be considered disordered eating or an eating disorder. Yes. And that's exactly what this person was. And to my student, I asked a question, are you willing to work at it an hour and a half a day for the rest of your life? Is that how you want your life to be? And then think of all the consequences, emotional, mental, of having to do this. Like it's terrible on someone's life. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of the health, yes, like health impact, like are they really getting the supposed health benefits by keeping that up? And I, yeah, my, my hunch is no. Because the stress imposed by this lady, it was a woman who kept up the weight. She was working 50 minutes, or hard workout, interval workout, 50 minutes a day, six days a week. Yeah. That's extremely stressful to the body. Yeah. Well, especially if you're then keeping your calories low as, as part of that. I mean, I work a lot with women who suffer with hypothermic amenorrhea. So, so not getting your periods because of under eating and over exercising. And so, yeah, when I hear things like that, my first inclination is always like, I wonder if they're getting a period. Yes. So we've understood what set point is. We've understood the metabolic impact of the body to maintain or to manage weight. How does someone set point increases? Because at this point, most of my listeners are like, yep, 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 that's me. And now I'm at this larger weight, bigger weight, higher weight. And therefore, my set point must have increased. How does that happen in someone? Okay. So again, lots of theories, um, but I can run through sort of a number of things that have been sort of identified as as potentially being linked to this. I mean, the biggest one is one we've already talked about in terms of dieting. Yeah. So restriction, dieting seems to increase someone's set point. And I mean, there's pretty solid evidence now that the best predictor for being at a higher weight or for weight gain is is dieting. And so that I mean, it could be linked to sort of the lean tissue that we've talked about before. It could be linked to lots of different things. But dieting, especially when you're doing it chronically over and over and over again, typically leads to an increasing or in weight set point. And I, I, like what I'm putting under that bracket of dieting is also things like unrealistic body standards, which is kind of driving why that's going on. There's a whole sort of area of research called cognitive dietary restraint, which looks at how our thinking impacts on body functions. And so you could have two people who are eating in the same way. If one person feels like this is overly restrictive and this is a diet and another person feels like this is great, I'm, I'm really enjoying this, et cetera, they can have very different experiences on how that's going to affect their, their physiology. And you've done a podcast on that, correct? I've done two podcasts on that. So to everyone listening, the Minnesota Study Podcast and the two podcasts on restraint will be linked in the show note as well for you to listen. But it's phenomenal on how your thinking yep. impact how your body absorbs food. Yep, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just absorbed food, it's, it's everything. And there's a load that looking at sort of like the cognitive load that there's then going on and your inability to then be able to put that mental energy towards other things. I mean, pretty much just across the board, yeah. the thoughts around dieting has an impact. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was part of those things. They try and tease out how much of this is coming from the starvation or the lack of nutrition component and how much of it is coming from the, the cognitive component of actually trying to diet. And they do, on some of them, they do a, a good job to, to point towards it is not simply just lack of food. So all of those components can impact on the weight set point. Another one, I mean, is like light usage and like circadian rhythm. Mm. And so people talk about the fact that 
weight has gone up in correlation with our changes in our in our food environment. And so since the 1950s, 60s, et cetera, with sort of more processed foods, with less cooking, with, with a real big change in how we eat, weight has gone up. You can make the same argument for the way that we have light and the use of lighting in terms of us looking at screens in the evening, us being on phones and iPads and, and all of that, and how much that impacts on our circadian rhythm. And what you can see is like, A, some of that stuff leads to people eating more food or craving different types of food. But even outside of actual eating of more food, even if calories are are stable, you can see increases in weight because of that. So I've mentioned kind of light during the nighttime or watching TV, et cetera. But I'd say equally during the daytime, not getting sunlight, not spending time outdoors seems to be a factor in increasing weight, the weight set point. You talked about the food, I don't want to call it quality, but food palatability, right? An impact on the reward mechanism. Can you talk about that, on how that influenced the set point as well? Yeah, so they look at, there's a, a thing that they compare where it's like metabolic weight gain versus hedonic weight gain. And hedonic kind of taking from the word hedonism, so so pleasure. And what they've looked at is that as the palatability of food increases, and palatability can be sort of the the like obviously the enjoyment of it. But what that normally means is you have higher amount of calories for volume of of food. And what they find is that as the palatability of food comes up your ability or your your tendency is to eat more of that food. I think, yes, that could be part of it, but I would also be interested to see what would happen with that outside of dieting because I, I think about the research that they've done around sugar addiction and the fact that, okay, sugar is so addictive, et cetera, and then when you look at all of the questions around it and you look at the people who are filling in those surveys, what they've basically just described is that they are a a dieter. Yes. And so if you remove that variable, what happens? And so I'd be interested to see if like, if you remove that variable of restriction, how hedonic is food really? And I would say that as well with, if you remove the variable of someone having loneliness, or you remove the variable of someone living in poverty, or you like, there are lots of other things that can then impact on how much someone is getting out of a certain food outside of just the experience of of eating. Absolutely. And I just want to put my own experience in there. There's no research, right, as you mentioned. But I know for me, now that I'm recovered from dieting and I eat intuitively, I will have highly palatable food. Yeah. But I get to a point where I don't want it anymore. Because it doesn't serve me like I naturally, quote, stop myself. I don't desire it anymore because it just doesn't serve my purpose. Yeah. So, yes, I'm agreeing with you because the simple fact of restricting this highly palatable processed food will want you to have more. But once you remove this restriction, your body will naturally regulate how much you crave of it. Yeah. And I, I mean, I did an experiment on myself. So I, I am someone who has never really dieted. Like okay. when I went to nutrition school, I, I would go through phases of like dairy's the worst, yes. so I pull it out, and then I'm like, oh, quinoa is amazing, so I'm eating lots of that. But it was always done from a just experimenting from a health perspective. I, I am lucky. I've lived in a lean body. I've never had issues around weight, so there was never this desire to change my eating so I would lose weight. If, if anything, it would be the other way around of like, what can I do to be able to, to put weight on? So I did an experiment of like, okay, let's see what happens when I just eat as much as humanly possible. And so I did this. The initial intention was to do it for three months. After nine weeks, I, I just gave up. But I I was eating, so I, I kept a log of, of everything and figured it all out. It was somewhere, I'm blanking on the exact figure, but it was somewhere between 3,200 and 3,300 calories a day. My normal amount is somewhere around about 2,700, 2,800. So you've got a, a surplus of about 500 calories a day. 
And so what happened was the first handful of weeks, my weight started to go up. Then my weight started to plateau. And then my weight started to come back down, despite the fact that I was eating all this food. And as time went on, I was like, I am so sick of eating this way. I'm so full. My food shifted so much more towards I'm having ready meals. I'm eating takeout. I'm including a big glass of wine with my meal just so I could get the calories in. But my body was like fighting back. I mean, I ended up like kind of giving myself gout <laughs> from, from doing this. Yes. But my weight then really didn't go up very much at all. And I think I ended the experiment. I'd eaten an extra 35,000 calories for what my body supposedly needed. And at the end of that, I was like two kilos heavier than when I started. And so I think that's kind of an indication as well that our bodies have places they want to keep us in, even in the face of palatable food. And look, I know I'm at the, the far end of the spectrum in that regard. Like I don't for a minute think that anyone who does that experiment is going to end up in the same place. But by that same token, it does kind of show what the body can do from, from a regulatory standpoint. I think it's very interesting from expert to expert in two different body types. So Chris probably did some research on my podcast and figured out that for me, my first diet was at 12 and I dieted for 25 years up and up yep. and down. Therefore, my set point is not in a normal quote range. And when I started my recovery and started to do intuitive eating and lifted the restriction, I did an involuntary overeating experiment yep. in which I ate all the food that were forbidden. Back then it was carbs because of keto and I gained weight, right? My body set point, the regulation of it was different than yours in which I gained weight. Though I didn't crave certain food after a while, still my body maintained a higher weight because my set point was now at this range. And I think that's where the discussion is interesting between you and me because we are in two different body cult type. Yep, definitely. And so for the women listening, this is just a proof of how your body act differently based on who you are, but also your history. Yep. And we'll get to that question, like how can we impact set point in the future? But I think we're two great examples of that, of how the body does what it thinks it's best for you. Totally. And so I think th this as well shows that kind of the genetic standpoint in terms of I've always been in a lean body, but I then didn't have any of the environmental factors that, that then mess with that. So I, I didn't have a history of dieting. I don't have a history of trauma. I don't have a history of poverty. I don't have like all of these other things that could go into it. And what was interesting was during that whole experiment, I was still giving like sleep, like a real preference. Like sleep is one of the most important things I can do. Like I know for me, sleep is is the thing that regulates everything else. Mm -hmm. And so what I thought was what would have been interesting would be if I did that experiment while I then was watching screens late at night, I was going to bed a lot later, I wasn't getting the sleep that I needed. How would that have impacted upon it? in terms of weight. And like, interestingly, there's been a handful of times in my life where my weight has gone yeah. up and gone up pretty quickly and still within my kind of normal set point range, but it's gone up, I don't know, five or six kilos or 10, 12 pounds. And those are times of stress when actually my eating went down. So one was when I didn't know what was going to happen with, with my visa. So I'm originally from Sydney, Australia. I moved to the UK. I was here for two years and then tried to get an extension on my visa. And, and the home office over here is rather incompetent. And I and kind of made a real mess of things. And I had a six-month period where I couldn't work. I didn't know what was going to happen. And my weight naturally went up during that time. I had another situation where my, my partner had had a miscarriage and it was a really stressful time. And in both scenarios were times when I was eating a lot less and yet my weight went up. So I think, yeah, stress would be another factor that has an impact on that. And then as the stress disappeared, because for me, it was more acute. It wasn't like this ongoing chronic thing. So after the, however long it took for that to repair, my weight naturally came down, my eating went back to normal and, and then things have just continued on like that. So let's talk about the impact of trauma, right? So chronic stress, trauma, on how that impacts your set point. 
And so this one, again, it, it's kind of a, a tricky one because it's like, is this because the trauma leads to someone eating more and using food for comfort, et cetera, or is, is it kind of separate from that? Have you done anything on the, the A study as part of your podcast before? We did talk about it with Irene Lyon, a somatic okay. expert, but you can quickly highlight a couple, a couple of minutes kind of highlight. So basically the ACE study was originally done or it kind of came out of someone working in a a weight loss clinic or at least a weight loss part of like a medical insurance or medical mm-hmm. clinic. And what they found was that people were, were doing weight loss, they were losing weight and they then started dropping out. And the point at which dropping out when they were plateauing and coming back up, they were dropping out at the point at which they were still losing weight. And so they brought some of the people back in to start to try and find out what happened and what was going on. And they basically stumbled upon the fact that there had been incest with one of the people and that when they were losing weight, they were starting to get attention again from men and they started to eat. And they then started to bring in some other people and ask this question. And they found that it had happened a lot. And so I think at the time, the the estimation was that incest happened in like one in a million or one in two million or something as extreme as that. And what they found was this was actually really common and or at least really common within that population. And so they then expanded this out and thought, okay, maybe this isn't just the only thing that's that's going on. And so they expanded out not just the population that they were using. So it went from a small population who all had issues around weight or were trying to lose weight to a population that was about 17 or 19,000 who were all just part of this insurance. And what they did is they then started to ask them about other forms of, they call them adverse childhood experiences. And so it could be abuse, so that's psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, had a parent been sent to jail. I'm kind of blanking on on some of the other ones, but there was this, this list of different traumas. And pretty much what they found is as your ACE score went up, so the amount of adverse childhood experiences went up, your likelihood of getting a whole host of different diseases increased your likelihood of participating in certain behaviors, whether that be drugs or alcohol or promiscuity or gambling or other things went up. And same with like weight was in, was included as, as part of this. And I think what's interesting, if I can just interrupt here. Yeah. When this study was done, the behavior of dieting diet culture was not perceived as something that was, quote, dangerous. Yep. But I would advance to say that the behavior of dieting, of controlling weight, is one of those behavior that we adopt to compensate for trauma in the same way as we use drug or alcohol. What is your opinion on that? I completely agree. It's like the way that I think about it is people keep their problems for a reason. Like these things are doing something really helpful for that person, as bizarre as that may sound. It is giving them a sense of control. It could be taking away some pain. It could be like for lots of different reasons, it's doing something beneficial for that person. And so simply saying like, stop doing that. Can't you see all of these other problems it's creating? Unless you are then giving someone another crutch or kind of still meeting that need in some other constructive way, you are not going to make headway. So yeah, that, that is that is my thoughts on that. So to the people that are sitting there and perhaps just like me have started dieted very young, that's why when we look in our methodology and our approach, we look at overcoming what you believe to be a weight issue, an emotional issue. We need to step back and understand how the behavior started and why the behavior started because it could simply be a coping mechanism. So just keep that in mind for everyone listening. Definitely. And I mean, the other thing I would add to that is trauma or at least the kind of stress that certain incidents can have on the body. I mean, weight stigma is one of those things. And so being told whether implicitly or explicitly all throughout your life that your body doesn't match up, that you're a failure, that you're lazy, etc., that has a real impact on people. And Again, I've done another whole episode on on weight stigma, and I can't find anything 
like any research that demonstrates that weight stigma is helpful. And even if you're putting it through the lens of, I think weight loss is a really good idea, I think it's going to lead to better health, even if you are still in that place, there is nothing in the research that says making people feel shitty about their body or their decisions or anything like that leads to someone changing their behavior long term. Like, yes, there will be some outlier who is like, oh, I I lost all this weight because someone told me that I was terrible or whatever. Like, fine. There will be someone like that. But on the whole, there is nothing in research to support this. And there's been a ton of research across the board about how just damaging this is. I fully agree with you. And again, on researched area, the diet culture, body image, weight stigma that many women carry through a period of 20 years, and then they end up at 40 realizing all this stuff, in my eyes, is trauma. It's trauma carried on. It's a little T trauma carried on over a period of 20 years instead of a one big incident. Like when you start studying trauma, there's different level of trauma on the spectrum. To me, this body image diet culture is trauma at a lower level, but chronically. Definitely. And the thing with the the adverse childhood experiences study, that the, all of those that they, they looked at were looking at what happened before someone was 18. And a lot of the focus also is on when someone's younger because of how that has a real change to your nervous system, your like stress response within the body, etc. And a lot of those seem to be fairly permanent. Like that's not good news, but it does feel like that starts to change how the body handles things. And that's not to say that that can't be mitigated in certain ways so that if someone has more time that they spend with meditation or more time that they spend with downtime or or whatever, they can't get to a place where that is having less of an impact. But yeah, I think if you've had a 20-year period where there has been ongoing chronic stress, that's going to have an impact. Yeah, I think me and you can have this discussion perhaps in 20 years from now when we're about (laughs) to retire and diet culture has been brought up forward as for what it is and how damaging it is. I think you and me are going to have a completely different discussion because research will have start to look into the consequence of shame and of weight stigma and how it affects someone, yeah. which I, I think at this point, we can't have an educated discussion other than clinical observation from both of our clients and patients. Yeah. So now the next question will get us to a whole other can of worms. Can someone change their set point? So we've talked about there, someone can change it up. And I think there's there's some fairly good evidence that there's a lot of things that make it more likely that it's going to go up that we've just covered in terms of the opposite direction. I don't know. Hmm. And there isn't anything to really support it. I mean, if, if you're looking at dieting, that would show that that is a failed endeavor. So that definitely doesn't lower someone's set point. And so what I would say is you can go through these different areas that we've chatted about and probably some that we didn't talk about. So by stopping dieting and restoring lean tissue and working on your connection with food and and the hedonic impact that it has on you, looking at things like loneliness and isolation and dealing with trauma and all of those, like that would be the thing that I would say would be, okay, do all of that and see what happens. And the thing is, even if that doesn't lead to weight loss, it's going to improve your health yes. astronomically. And so all of that is then going to be really beneficial with very little drawback. Whereas if you're going down the route of dieting for the 1% or 2% that it works for, and I'm using that in inverted commas, there's a lot of people where it doesn't, and it doesn't just not work. It then creates this whole cacophony of like other issues as, as part of that. So, I mean, we talked about this sort of before we started recording. When I put together this weight set point podcast, I was in slightly two minds about it. And the reason I, I say that is I think it's really helpful to learn about, okay, there's all of these different factors that go into impacting on our weight. We don't really have control of our weight. Our body wants to regulate us in a preferred level. And so it can make someone be like, okay, I can now relax around this because really there's nothing I can do. But I think the flip side of that is when you hear about the fact that 
Okay, dieting has potentially raised your set point from where it would have ordinarily been. That gets into a lot of like what if thinking, like oh, what if I didn't do this when I was yes. when I was twenty, or like what would my set point have been? Or even the question you're asking, like oh, maybe I can now start to figure out the way that I can lower my set point. And yeah, I find that that's kind of a slippery slope. And it doesn't tend to lead people to the place that they hope that it will versus focusing on all of these other things that we talked about that will definitely lead to you being in a better health. And I mean, health, like physically, mentally, emotionally, irrespective of what happens with the weight. I think it's a very important point here. And I can perhaps suggest one sentence, chase health instead of chasing weight loss. Yep. And I would say that, and I would still, like, the, the, the caveat I would add to that is, like, understand what, like, real health means as part of that. Because chasing health for someone who is maybe new to this or is coming at it from a, a specific perspective, that could mean, okay, I can only eat organic and I have to have this many servings of fruits and vegetables and I've got to do this thing and that thing. And and I think we get pretty myopic in what we focus on around what actually leads to to better health. And it is very much kind of food focused where so many other components start to drop away. There's that the like Harvard blanking on the research name is like the Harvard School Research where they basically followed these people for about 70 years looking at how different things impact on their health. And they took one cohort or one set was people who went to Harvard and to the school. And then there is this other group where it was people who just lived in the Boston area, but was at a lower socioeconomics, didn't go to Harvard. And they just followed these guys for a really long time. They've now started to track their spouses. They start to track their kids to see what are the things that really predict health. And the thing that they've come up with after all this time is healthy relationships, like healthy relationships outperform everything else within our life. And that's not to say that food doesn't matter, but how often are people kind of getting up on their soapbox about how important relationships are versus why you should be eating pomegranate or whatever it may be? What is your opinion? I want a question that popped into my head as a professional like me. What is your opinion on why over the last 20, 30, 40 years, we focus so much on food to be the gateway to health instead of what we used to know in holistic health to be mind, body, spirituality, and physical aspect? I don't know. I mean, the, the thing that comes up for me is there has been this real shift towards like the individual and individual responsibility. And I think food, when through that lens, appears to be very much within the control of the person. Whereas if you actually look at the data around what makes sort of the best health outcomes or makes the worst out health outcomes, like poverty and socioeconomics, like trumps absolutely everything else. And so like poverty, socioeconomics, that's a difficult thing to deal with. Like that's a a government level thing to deal with. And so that then doesn't become the focus. You you focus on the individual. It's like, well, you could eat better or you could do more exercise or you could make these changes. And depending on where you are on the scale will depend. And when I say scale, I mean like the socioeconomic scale will depend on how easy or more difficult it is to make certain changes. And so part of me thinks it's it's coming from that place, maybe part of the other things is like it's slightly easier to focus on that. It gets a little messier and squishier outside of those things, although there's like really good research coming out now about loneliness and, and how detrimental that is. So, I yeah, I really – I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's been in more recent time the whole kind of wellness culture, and that's probably had a really big impact – the fact that there is food availability like there never was before. I mean, with most things in health, it's complicated. I don't yeah. think there is one answer for it. I mean, again, like diet culture probably plays a very big 
part, people are dieting like they never were before. And so as part of that, food becomes front row and center. And so that's why we start to focus on it so much. But yeah, I mean, it is food is important, but it is just one part of many, many, many things that will will impact on health. So that leads me to my other question. You're a nutritionist just like me. And clearly we went to school to learn how food is important to health. Yep. And how long has it been since you graduated? So graduated in 2008. So what, 11 years? I graduated eight years ago. And my practice has changed tremendously from the moment I graduated to the day. So yep. how do you practice nutrition today? now that you know everything we've been talking about for the last hour? So, I mean, the thing that I say again and again and again with clients is context. Like context matters. And I think that gets forgotten about where it's like this bit of research has showed this thing, so that's then going to be applicable to you. Despite the fact that the research was done on 20-year-old men and men and you're a 45-year-old woman, But yeah, people forget about the context of what's going on. And so when I'm working with someone, I'm trying to think about, okay, what is the low hanging fruit here that is kind of going to be an easy thing that they can change? It's going to make a really big difference here. What are the more likely things that are going to be having an impact on them? And the reality is like food, yes, is part of that, but it's just, again, it's one part of it. And so when I'm working with someone, it's kind of keeping those things in mind. And uh, kind of a, a mantra that I'm always repeating to myself is, it's more important to be effective than right. And what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter how much I can look at someone's situation and be like, okay, if you did this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing differently, things will be so much better for you. It's like, if I tell that person that, is, are they actually going to change? And most of the time it's like, no, they're not because they're just not in a position to be able to do that. That's too difficult. They've got kids. So this thing won't work, et cetera. So it's like, how do we figure out what is going to work for this individual? And so very much taking an approach of like, I'm not the expert. It's like, I'm here as a guide. Let's kind of figure this out together. Where do you want to start with this? What do you think could be helpful? And yes, I'm going to be a sounding board. And yes, I'm going to give my opinion on certain things. But it is very much with the frame of, okay, how is this going to work? What is this person going to be able to do? And how do we get them to to make those changes? And finding what is their like innate motivation there, their innate desire to make changes. Because the more, I mean, the more I tell them, like, you should do this, you've got to do that, et cetera, the more that they are like, no, I don't want to do that. And and they will come up with all the reasons why they can't do that, et cetera. So it is, it's really kind of helping them along where they're the ones that are talking about what they want to change and what they want to do and the direction they want to go. I love that. And I think the context piece for me is why I do what I do today. I never realized it until you said it. But for people come to us or used to come to me as a nutritionist to get a meal plan and to know what to eat and how much to eat. And it was all about food. And then I realized that their history around food, their context around food had to dictate how I approach food because just repeating what they've always had got me to a worse situation. I had to impact the context first, the relationship to food, before I could even talk about food. Do you find the same thing for you? Definitely. Yeah. And so a lot of it is working on someone's relationship with food. I mean, I I talk about when I work with clients, there is the the physiological side to understanding how various systems work, how, how different things are going for them at the moment. But then there's also the sort of psychological, mental, emotional piece. And if you're just working on on the physiological and you forget that other piece, you don't get very far because, yeah, maybe someone does it for a while and then they stop because it just feels like a diet. And so, yeah, definitely keeping those two things in mind. And I, I would also say while this has worked out well for me because I do think this is the right way of dealing with health this is also the way that I'm wired. Like I would be terrible as like a sports nutritionist if I'm just going down that very analytical way of thinking. Like I like the kind of messier side of what reality looks like for someone because, I mean, that's the important thing of like what's going on in someone's life and how do we need to bring those things into 
the discussion that we have about what is doable. Mm -hmm. So you do work with people. Do you mind walking us through how can people work with you or what's the approach you take? So the way that I work with people is for a period of five months. I, I don't do just one-off consults. <laughs> I, I found that that just really doesn't work, especially with the approach that I take and also the kinds of clients that I'm working with. And so we're having a consult every two weeks. They've got email support between that. The consults are an hour, hour and 45, like whatever we need the consult to be. And it is, as I said, working on that kind of physiology and psychology piece. And the clients that I typically work with are like women who are overcoming dieting and who have this real chronic history of dieting. I work a lot with disordered eating and eating disorders and on that spectrum and a lot with hypothalamic amenorrhea, which I mentioned earlier on. So when someone's not getting their period and helping them to regain their period and often helping them to, to conceive as well. And so with all of those populations, there is so much that has gone on in their past that is not like they're a clean slate where you're just like, okay, cool, just do these things and that thing. And they just get on board straight away and are able to do it. And that's just straightforward. There is all of this other stuff that you're trying to sort through to be able to get them to, to that place of being able to listen to their body. And I know you're a big advocate of intuitive eating and I'm, I definitely work that way with, with clients as well. But yeah, to be able to get someone to that place and to work through that is a process. It's not, I, I always laugh when people are like, oh, just eat in moderation. I'm like, that is a skill. That's not a just you hear that slogan and then you know how to do it. And I would say the same thing about intuitive eating and listening to your body. It's not like, oh, no one had ever told me that before. Now I can do it. There is like work that needs to, to go on to get to that place. And I think, again, come back to the word context, right? We know our population, we know who comes to us, and we have a different context for that population. If an athlete, I used to have when I was in clinic, athletes that would come to me, I did two or three of them and I couldn't because it's like dealing with a machine, right? It's basically you fuel the machine for an output of certain type. But when you start applying context like you're doing in your practice, then you are approaching the health of your patient in a way where it's actually going to permanently change their health. Like that's where magic happens. Definitely. And I mean, even with your example with athletes, if they were willing to start to dig a couple of layers under, I oh. imagine there would be a lot of other things that you could do there. But if they're coming solely for performance and performance in a very narrow band, I want to do better at my chosen sport, then maybe you're a little bit more boxed in, in, in what, what you can offer. But yeah, there's a lot of athletes that I've worked with because they're like, I've now lost my period and I have a disordered relationship with food and I have exercise compulsion, etc. cetera. I, I used to, my clinic used to be above a gym. Okay. And the gym, the, the, the trainers that were working there, some of them were working in the bodybuilding field. Yep. So I had a, I had a few people that would climb up the stairs and come and see me because now they had binge eating disorder. They didn't know that what it was because of the dieting cycle into bodybuilding. So, but not everyone is willing to go quote there. So no, and I think it's interesting that when the restrictions going on, no one ever sees that as a problem. But when the binging starts, that's when there's the problem. It's never like, oh, I need to stop this restriction so I can't binge. It's like, why am I binging? I don't understand why I'm binging. I never used to binge. But you know what's worse? In the circle of bodybuilding, that's an expected outcome, and that's normalized. It's called weight rebound. Yep. So, so binge eating disorder is not a problem. It's part of the process. And to gain the weight and to lose the weight is just the, this is how distorted, anyway, the bodybuilding and fitness industry can be. <laughs> yep. No. We are in alignment on, on our thoughts around that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been longer than I expected, but I think we could start, we can continue talking for hours. I'm going to link to all the podcasts, all your information. Thank you so much for having spent that time with us today. Well, thank you for having me on here. This has been a really great conversation. There you have it, ladies. So what did you learn? I know for some of you, it's probably going to accentuate that 
shocking element to this whole discovery of anti-diet and intuitive eating and body neutrality of realizing that at this point in time, we have no known mechanism to control your set point, nor do we know, or do we have a machine we can plug you on to determine your set point. But if you are ready to move past that, I would like to offer you a tool and a next step for you to understand your particular situation around set point. Again, this is not a machine that's going to say your set point is 173 pounds. That's not what I'm talking about because it doesn't exist, right? And I don't give you BS on this podcast. What I'm going to give you instead is what you should do. Step number one is if you haven't read Health at Every Size by Dr. Linda Bacon, that would be your next step. Go buy this book on Amazon, $25, $20, and get reading. Two, I'm going to provide you with a link for a PDF, which is an extract of the Health at Every Size book with question based on science that Dr. Linda Bacon has put together to help you determine if you are at a healthy set point, like your current set point, are you at it? Or are you below your set point? Or are you above your set point? So it's a questionnaire to help you determine if you are at it, above, or in the middle at your healthy weight. And then within the question, it will give you your focus point of what you need to target next to create safety within your body so your body regulate itself at its normal set point, whatever that is for you. And it's, surprise, surprise, likely not what you think it is, right? So this link will be in the show notes. So stephaniedodier.com slash 214. And then answer the question. The next step after this, once you've determined where you are and the area where you need to do work, right? You may want to go and listen to podcast 155, where I explain the stages of transformation in someone's life. And it's around weight, it's around eating habits or anything in your life. There's six distinct transformation stages, identify where you are, and then from there, seek help. There's various solution to help you work through the element that contributes to your set point. Do it yourself option would be Health at Every Size book. Dr. Linda Bacon at the end of the book gives you kind of a framework you can follow to regulate your relationship to food and body. And also the book from my mentor, Evelyn Triboli, Intuitive Eating. Second option, if you want some support, we offer a program to help you work through this. We offer a group program that integrates all the element, mental, mindset, emotion, body image, intuitive eating, and that's called the Going to Beyond the Food Academy. It's available for you to join at any time. And then the second option would be, if you want more of an individual approach, would be to work one-on-one with me through a program that we have called Conquer and Thrive, that it's open only once a year. The link will be in the show notes as well. If we're open, you can submit your application and we'll work together if we're the right fit for one another. So these were my guidelines or next step for you. If you have any questions, always feel free to contact me via social media or our email info at stephaniedote.com. If you enjoyed the show, I would absolutely ask, request <laughs> that you leave us a review on iTunes and or the, the podcast app that you have iTunes being the main platform, the more review we have, the higher the podcast rank as being a people's favorite and it's being shown to people more. So it really means a lot to us when you leave a review. And Weight Loss Series Part 3 will be coming to you in Podcast 214 to 14, where we talk about the whole BMI situation. So I love you, sister, and I'm looking forward to hang out with you in the next episode.